Welcome to OCC. My name is Michael Bells, pastor here at OCC, a really community church, and we're so glad you've joined us today. As that video reminds us, every single life is important. And if you're watching online, we, we know you're staying warm. Others have braved the cold to, to gather in person today. But at OCC, we're, we're glad for all of you, those of us who, who are meeting online and those of us who are meeting in person. Province of Ontario uh, keeps has announced more changes coming, but none of them really affect how we meet as a church in the, in the short term, since we're already practicing the requirements in terms of physical distancing and spacing. It's, it's a confusing time. We, we need, need to recognize us. But we also need to know that our God is so much bigger, so much greater than all of this. And even more than that, we need to recognize and know that our God is with us. God is still at work in our world, even in those places that we don't see how he could possibly at work. God still works. This last week, uh, Op Open Doors released its 2022 World Watch List the, uh, of the 50 most difficult places to be a Christian. And so before we enter into a time of, of worship and song today, I want us to watch this video that, that introduces us to that and reminds us that we need to be lifting up and praying for our brothers and sisters that are facing real persecution. Many Christians around the world experience hostility as a result of their identification with Christ. They face immense pressure and sometimes violence. They encounter hostile attitudes, words, and actions. Out of 2.5 billion Christians, the 2022 World Watchlist Report states that more than 360 million Christians around the world suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their faith in Jesus Christ. 312 million of them are from World Watch List top 50 countries alone. Worldwide, that is one in every seven Christians. One in seven Christians are threatened, shunned, imprisoned, displaced, abducted, or beaten. Some are pressured to convert. Some cannot possess religious materials. Some are driven from their homes. Some lose access to education or jobs. Some must keep their faith a secret. Their churches are raided, closed, or destroyed. Our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ live in this reality every day, all because they refuse to deny the name of the one who died for them, the one who died to save all of us. The 2022 report describes a rise in persecution. In the last year, there has been violence from extremist groups, military coups, political unrest, wars, and kidnappings. Many Christians have become refugees seeking safety, and many Christians have uncertain futures. As a body of believers, we are called to pray for one another. Visit opendoorscanada.org forward slash world watch list to download your copy of the 2022 World Watch List Prayer Guide. Join us as we pray for our persecuted family around the world. Lord, we pray for those and with those in our world who are deprived of religious freedom, those who suffer persecution, tor torture, death because of their faith. We pray for those who are threatened by persecution, by starvation, by deadly violence because of their faith in you. May they be strengthened in their trusting you. May they know that we pray for them. And we pray as well that you, Lord, may inspire leaders of governments to uphold religious freedom and care for the well-being of all people, especially the poor and vulnerable. We, so we pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are persecuted because of their faith. May they be freed from anxiety and fear. May they be strengthened in their courageous witness. And may peace come to their troubled lands. We pray this in Jesus' name. So in light of all that, uh, join us as we worship with our worship team. I'm observing things going on in our world lately. It's pretty crazy up there, isn't it? There's a lot to process, a lot to put together and it's, it's tough to figure out what God wants of us in this situation so uh, for me the rules are still the same though uh, fix your eyes on Jesus trust in him and not our will but his be done and I think if uh, you have struggle with any one of those steps if you back up to the one before then uh, you might be okay but anyway that's what I tried so our songs this morning are a bit of a journey about that 
so I hope you'll join us in the first one that's about fixing your eyes on Jesus. truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness I will follow you my lighthouse my lighthouse I will trust the promise you will carry me safe to shore my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me.
is stripped away by simply calm Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your couple things to uh, remind us of. Our life groups are meeting online Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, Thursday at 7, and I encourage you to, to join us. Get connected uh, and be encouraged and encourage others. Uh, we gather as well Sunday nights from 6.30 to 7.30 in a Zoom room to uh, pray for one another and to pray for our worlds. And so I encourage you again, join us for that. We're reading through the New Testament, and it's not too late to start. You can get a copy of our reading plan online. See, we need to know God's Word. Um, we get bombarded by so many voices. We need to hear God's voice. And so reading the Scriptures, reading the Bible, it helps us to live the way we're created to live. Sensitive to God, uh, attentive to uh, others around us and attentive to what God is doing in and through us. And so let me encourage you to uh, get connected that way to the Word of God. Let me uh, tell you about a couple of uh, ministry opportunities. Uh, most of you, or many of you know that OCC is being used as an overnight warming center when the temperature drops below minus 15. Uh, it's well staffed with uh, both staff and volunteers. But one of the areas of help that they need is, take, is taking the blankets to a laundromat over at Westridge to do the laundry. Um, everything, everything's provided, the laundry, uh, Soap is provided, the, uh, the equipment's provided, and we, you just need somebody to take it over and do it. And so if you can help with that, uh, let, let us know and we'll connect you with the Warming Center Coordinator. Uh, 
The other uh, opportunity for, for ministry uh, is we need someone to pick up food uh, from Mariposa Market, uh, either on Wednesday or Thursday at six o'clock. Uh, if it's on Wednesday, you take it directly over to the lighthouse. If it's Thursday evening, uh, you take it to take it home and then take it up to the Sharing Place Food Bank on, uh, th on, on Friday morning. Uh, don't forget the uh, coldest night of the year fundraising initiative and uh, all, all the details are, are there on our website. Let's, let's pray together before we come to the word this morning. Heavenly Father, you call us to be your friends and to make friends of others, to recognize in them what you are doing. And so we pray for ourselves and we pray for our world. We pray for the areas in the world where deep divisions run between uh, various groups because of race, religion, past history. Help your people to be your friends and to make friends. We pray for our communities where, where different traditions shape different outlooks on things. Lord, help us as your people to listen well and so that we may learn to live together, knowing that though we're different, we are all created in your image. Lord, we pray for our own families, where, where growing up is difficult, where harsh words are sometimes spoken in anger and are not easily taken back, and hurtful or thoughtless actions are endangering relationships. Lord, empower your children to be patient, slow to anger, and to become wise in their speaking and acting and living as your family in Jesus. And so we pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, in heaven. May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Anyone here like criticism? How, how do you respond to criticism? Does being criticized bring you down or does it fire you up? Does it make you want to hunker down in your own bunker or does it make you want to throw a whole bunch of garbage back at your critics? Learning how to respond to criticism is, is a lifelong journey. If you're not criticized in person, you definitely will be on social media. Critics are going to accompany you for your entire life. 
you know, we look at the world of politics. It's full of criticism. You know, political games that are taking place right now around vaccines and COVID and schools and healthcare. The, the, the wonders of, of local politics. Uh, what's going to happen with a provincial election this summer? And then there's world politics, which gets more and more complicated every year. And with elections, with politics, there's, there's no shortage of negative, critical remarks flying. Of course, everybody uh, vigorously com claims that they hate negative or attack ads and every candidate uses them because attack ads work. Surveys show that those nasty, negative, often highly personal attacks are the most effective way of swaying public opinion. Negativity, bad mouthing, uh, profoundly changes the way we think and the way we act. It's a Charlie Brown cartoon uh, where uh, little, little brother Linus is looking very forlorn and asks his big sister Lucy, why are you so anxious to criticize me? And Lucy, looking very self-righteous, replies, I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults. And, and Linus turns indignant. But what about your own faults, he asks. Oh, I have a knack for overlooking them. Or in another classic, uh, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, you know what your trouble is? The whole trouble with you is that you're you. Well, what in the world can I do about that? I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the trouble. There's lots of people like that in our world, isn't there? They delight in pointing out the trouble. And unfortunately, sometimes those best at hurting and critiquing and minimizing us are those closest to us. I, I like this quote from Franklin Jones. Honest criticism is hard to take, particularly from a relative, a friend, an acquaintance, or a stranger. <laughs> it doesn't matter where it comes from. Criticism is hard to take. And anyway, we're, we're here in the Gospel of Mark, and today we want to look at a section where Jesus deals with criticism that comes his way. So let's watch this scene from Mark 3, verses 20 to verse 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Yeah, then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. 
One of uh, Mark's favorite literary tools is what's called the, the Markin sandwich. It's called a, a Markin sandwich because Mark uses this technique of inserting one story inside another story in order to demonstrate the, the connectedness of this two. So here in uh, this passage, Mark begins with Jesus' family in verses 20 and 21. Then he interrupts the story in verse 22 with the accusations that come from the scribes and how Jesus responds to them. And then he comes back to the family in verses 31 to 34. So we have a, a Mark and sandwich. As I said, here in Mark 3, Jesus is being attacked by critics. And the first in line, his own family. It's, and it's easy to see how those who knew Jesus as, as brother, cousin, uh, nephew, uncle, brother-in-law, yeah, G Jesus was all of those. Somebody probably called him the, the Hebrew equivalent of, of Uncle Jesus. These were people who were used to, to sitting with Jesus at family meals, uh, working with him in the family business, telling jokes, uh, burping babies with him. They'd find his new presence and persona foreign and, and maybe even a little frightening. And, and glimpsing this, this God-inspired power that was drawing a, a whole new group of followers to this man who had simply been a brother or a cousin, a nephew, uh, Jesus' family assumes the worst. He's gone out of his mind. Can you imagine what it might have been like for Jesus to be rejected by and to be labeled as crazy by those he had known and lived and loved longest and best. And all this was so early in his ministry. And yet despite this, this deeply personal attack, Jesus doesn't personalize his response. His, his, his focus remains on the family, but Jesus begins to redefine who family is. Fast forward to verse 35, and Jesus says that his family is all those who do the will of God. A definition that certainly leaves the door wide open for all of his blood relatives, but now also includes all those who follow him and recognize God's spirit being present in him. Family confrontation such as described as here in Mark 3 could easily turn someone into a wound licker. A wound licker is someone who cannot hear a critique or suffer a personal injury, or have some stuff happen to them, but refuses to allow healing to take place. They can't let it go. Hannibal was a 180-pound uh, Great Pyrenees. He looked like a huge, all-white St. Bernard. And one day, an enthusiastic tail wag whacked his long plume tail against the wall. He broke the skin on the very tip of the tail and made it bleed a little. No big deal, except Hannibal wouldn't let it go. He started licking his wound and he kept on licking. The constant licking of the wound roughed it up and ripped it open and ruined it and the tail became infected and a, a tailectomy had to be performed and his tail was docked to half of its original length and sent home to uh, after dog surgery to recuperate. Hannibal wouldn't let the wound go and despite having one of those great lampshade collars around his neck he still managed to back himself into a corner and get a hold of his injured tail. He licked and he licked and he licked it into a renewed state of despair and a second surgery was ne necessary to, to dock his, uh, his long plume into a little bunny tail and his uh, lamp collar, uh, lampshade collar was replaced by a five gallon straight edged bucket. You know, Hannibal was the most ridiculous big dog you've ever seen. Big bucket on his head, puny tail on his, on his rear. Hannibal wouldn't let go of his wound. He was obsessed. He was worrying over it and working on it. And his obsession over his woundedness almost got him killed. Concentrating on the wounds we receive from whatever source, the barbed critiques that poke and prod and snipe and snarl at us can turn any of us into frantic, self-destructive wound, lick, wound lickers. Our, our, our identity, our focus becomes on what's happened to me. Yes, we need to hear crit our critics and, and deal with the criticism, but then drop off all that critical mass off at the next tash, trash receptacle. Don't worry about letting it go. There'll be lots more to come. Mark, Mark now brings into the picture the, the teachers of the law. Uh, There's a contingent of scribes from Jerusalem, most likely sent by the Sanhedrin to investigate this, this preacher, this teacher, this healer, this, this exorcist who was suddenly attracting these large crowds of followers and he, and he wasn't identified with the, the religious establishment. A couple of things to note here. Uh, this is Mark 3. 
And, and that's significant because it means we're still in the early days of Jesus' ministry. Uh, at the end of chapter 2, he had just called his 12 disciples. He's not spent a lot of time with them yet. He hasn't traveled very far. And the key signs of the kingdom, the key signs of, of what Jesus has done have, have been healing and, and casting out of demons. And, and both of those are signs of God's kingdom breaking in. Both are signs that, that people are being set free and the kingdom of God is Jesus' come in person. And these teachers of the law, these scribes, they can't handle the good news. They can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth! That's the voice that was going through your mind, wasn't it? Jack Nicholson and a few good men. So they're making these accusations. He's possessed by Beelzebub. He's the prince of demons. This is the source of him driving them out, driving other demons out. In other words, they're claiming the only way Jesus can possibly be driving out demons is because he himself is possessed by the head demon. These, these are religious authorities are making up their own rules, their own assessment of Jesus and his activities. They accuse them of being possessed by this ancient Canaanite God. And they conclude that any act of exorcism, any demons being cast out by him, were carried out by other demonic powers, by, by the ruler of the demons. In other words, they're charging Jesus with practicing sorcery or magic, which is a serious crime in Judaism. It was punishable by death. And Jesus' response to all of this is described as a parable in verse 23. It's the first time that, that Mark uses this term. A parable throws or, or places two different things side by side for comparison. So, so Mark writes in sandwiches and Jesus speaks in parables. Verse 28, 23. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And so Jesus sharpens the whole focus of the scribe's accusations. He replaces the obscure term from uh, Beelzebub with the more familiar term Satan. And Jesus is declaring that combating the hold that Satan has on this world is his mission. Why, why would Satan then enable the very one who has come to destroy him? Such an action would be a kingdom or a household divided against itself. And, and one of the things that had happened recently was the implosion of Herod's reign, the Herodian dynasty. And Mark's audience would be then well acquainted with the destructive consequences that come from a divided kingdom. Verse 25, Jesus says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. And in light of the accusations of madness leveled at him by his own family, Jesus' mention of a divided household is, is, is poignant. The second parabolic argument that Jesus offers is the example of the strong man who first must be bound if his house is to be plundered. Verse 27, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. And that image asserts Satan's strength in this world. And yet at the same time points to the fact that Jesus' power is greater. If Satan is the strong man who holds the world in, its death, in his death grip, then with every exorcism, with every healing, Jesus demonstrates his greater power over that evil. Now Jesus concludes his response to these scribes with his first amen saying in verse 28. And depending on your, your translation, your Bible may read, I tell you the truth, or truly I tell you, verily, the, the word in the Greek is, is amen. It's a distinctive formula that's used only by Jesus. And it's the beginning of an authoritative, uh, like an Old Testament, thus saith the Lord pronouncement. And so what Jesus proclaims in verse 28 to 30 is a promise of forgiveness and of condemnation. Promise of forgiveness is broadly spread. Whatever blasphemies they utter, the promise of condemnation is highly specific. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is often called the unforgivable sin. It's been defined and redefined and reconfigured by many theologians and churches over the centuries. You know, Augustine concluded it was the sin of continued failure to come to repentance and a stubborn resistance to God's grace. Uh, Calvin believed that the unforgivable sin is committed when we knowingly endeavor to extinguish the Spirit. Some have called adultery or murder or denying Christ when threatened with persecution as being unforgivable. Others say it's when you attribute spirit-empowered miracles to Satan. 
And blasphemy against the Holy Spirit has often become a, a, a weapon, uh, uh, become uh, what, against whatever theological mandate was in charge, whether the Catholic or Calvinistic or Puritan or Armenian or Reformed holiness or, or whatever. It serves as fuel for theological firestorms. But in the context of Mark's account, the gospel about Jesus, this blasphemy that Jesus speaks of, is very specific. Jesus is speaking to those who have either seen for themselves Jesus' healing and his exorcisms, or they're there as official representatives of religious leaders, and they don't like what's happening. And they have refused to see these things, these exorcisms, these healings, as the work of God's Spirit. Instead, they have blasphemed by ascribing the presence of the Holy Spirit to the presence of the Prince of Demons. They look at good and they see only evil. They look at Jesus who possesses the Spirit of God, who's filled with the Spirit of God, and they declare him to have an unclean spirit. It's something like a conspiracy theory. Once you start believing in one, you take all the evidence and you, you force it into your theory. Everything's got to fit, fit your image. Or it's you believe your surgeon's going to perform a life-saving uh, save, save, surgery on you, but he's really a statistic killer. And you see you're never going to give your consent to the surgery, no matter how badly you need it. There's, there's no middle way. You see... And this is what's crucial. Jesus is not a mildly interesting historical figure. He's either a lunatic, a raving madman, delusional, or he is who he says he is, the one who is bringing God's kingdom. C.S. Lewis, in his uh, radio lectures entitled Mere Christianity, which was turned into, a, into an excellent little book, puts it this way. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying that really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, that's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, Lewis says. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Mark, Mark now refers, returns to the, the last part of the sandwich, refocuses on the conflict within, within Jesus' own family. Um, and so sometimes the details, this is in verse 31 to 35, sometimes the details are telling. Do you notice where, where Jesus' family are? It says his family stand outside. They're, they're, they're cut off from approaching Jesus, Jesus and, and a tri dragging him home by the crowds of those who are listening to him and learning from him. Just a few verses late, earlier, Mark had described the, the calling of Jesus' chosen 12. And this beginning of the creation of this new community, this new family of faith that will walk and work with Jesus throughout his earthly mission. This new family of faith are the ones who are inside, next to Jesus, surrounding him. While his family, those who have labeled Jesus as out of his mind, are cut off, they're remote from those relationships. And then Mark gives us another first. This is the first time that Mark records Jesus is using this word or this phrase. And several times in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus will say, whoever or if anyone, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Family is now redefined as whoever does the will of God. See, Jesus had cast out hurtful demons from suffering people. He had healed paralytics. He had gathered a ragtag uh, collection of people. Some called them scum or ragamuffins or sinners. An assortment of people around him to listen, to learn about the love of God and the promise of God's coming kingdom. And for these terrible actions, he was branded as crazy, as possessed, as blasphemous, as an instrument of the prince of demons. And did you catch Jesus' answer to his critics, he doesn't assault any of them. He doesn't attack them. When his relatives called him crazy, he, he turns the other cheek and celebrates his new family, a family that in no way excluded his earthly family. 
When, when the scribes attacked him with their, with their arsenal of, of theological brick rocks, he turned the other cheek and exposed their faulty lo logic, even as he revealed the truth about his own source of power. He calmly offered his critics something called choice and consequences. They get to choose, but with their choice comes consequence. They either embrace and acknowledge the presence of God's Spirit and embrace God's will, or if they choose to view good as evil, they suffer the consequences. Choices have consequences. And either way, Jesus keeps moving. You see, sometimes being wrongly criticized, being told we're wrong, you're crazy, lazy, foolish, you're at fault, you're weak, you're alone, none of that's ever fun. But sometimes that criticism can be a sign that you're doing something that matters enough to stir up, stir up stagnant waters. Gandhi was yelled at and hooted at and thrown stones at, hauled away throughout his lifetime of, of activism. But being criticized and censored wasn't the greatest challenge he experienced. After a lifetime of being on the outside, he was suddenly ushered into the sort of the inner sanctums. And Gandhi noticed this, noted this, when we try to bring about changes in our societies, we are treated at first with indifference, then with ridicule, then with abuse, then with opposition, and finally the greatest challenge is thrown at us. We are treated with respect. That's the most dangerous stage. There's something more dangerous than criticism, and that's something is respectability. Don't, don't respond to the critiques of yourself with the critique of your, of your critics. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. didn't inspire the nation and transform the beginning of the, the civil rights movement and the, a journey that's still ongoing in terms of giving rights to all people in North American society by announcing, I have a complaint, I have a beef. No, Martin Luther King Jr. looked at all that was wrong. He looked at all that was unjust and all that was sinful, and he did not offer the world a critique. Instead, he offered the world a dream, a new vision of justice and mercy and love. Or to use the language of a couple of weeks ago, he told a new story. And on what basis did Martin Luther King Jr. build his dream? His basis was his place and participation in family. Not as American family, not even his Baptist family, but as a member of Jesus' family and the family of God. Whenever Mother Teresa would meet someone who was particularly obnoxious or hateful, mean or disturbed, she would say to herself, here is Jesus in a distressing disguise. You will meet lots of Jesuses in distressing disguises in your lifetime. Uh, there's a, an ancient, uh, or supposedly an, an ancient Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. It certainly sounds very up-to-date to me. We are living in interesting times. We're living in a world where if we have eyes to see, we see Jesus in some distressing disguises. We're living in a world with lots of razor-bladed religious people out there. But let me remind us, followership starts with Jesus, stays with Jesus, goes with Jesus, and ends with Jesus. The family of God, the kingdom of God, is always bigger than we think. But it always starts with Jesus, stays with Jesus, goes with Jesus. We go together with Jesus and ends with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as you're speaking to us this morning from your word, I pray that your spirit would be ministering to each one who's watching today. Father, stir in their heart that call to, to follow you, to stay with you, to go with you to run with you to the very end. Father, in the midst of all of the, the, the distresses and the conflict and the criti criticisms and all of the stuff that just bombards us from day to day, help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and see those things that you are doing. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Shine upon you. May 
his graciousness be like an endless stream. May the Lord show his favor to your house and your neighbor, to the last remaining strains of striving cease. May he grant you The sadness building up Every turn adds to the cup And the loss is last a measure of my gain In the shadow of this curse Where the best implies the worst If you're like me, you need to hear somebody say May the Lord bless and keep you, may the face shine upon you, may his graciousness be like an endless dream. May the Lord show his favor to your house and your neighbor, to the last remaining strains of striving grant you peace. In my heart there's a sadness building up. Every turn adds to the cup. As the losses match the measure of my gain. The shadow of this curse where the best implies the worst If you're like me, you need to hear somebody say May the Lord bless and keep you May His face shine upon you May His graciousness be like an endless dream Give you for the blueberries. Sisters and brothers of Jesus, go into all the world. Go forth with forgiveness and grace. Go forth with compassion and love. Go forth as Jesus' family for all the world to see.